You guys know what the H-1B visa is? We don't talk about it a lot on no, our show. We don't. We don't. We, I remember us talking yeah, about it. Yeah, it is the professional work visa. It's the specialized work visa. It's the most basic work visa you would get if you are a graduate of a university and working in a specialized job. The way they define what a specialized job is, do you have the equivalent of a university degree? And are you working in a job that requires the minimum requirements are a university degree? If you have those two things, a equivalent of a university degree, the minimum requirements for the job, that would be a specialized job that would allow you to apply for an H-1B visa. And you have to be working in a job, by the way, that's related to your degree. So there's three requirements. I forgot to add that. I might as well add all three. Okay. Okay. One is you have a college degree or equivalent. You're working in a job that has the minimum requirements require a college degree. And number three, you're working in a job that's related to your education. Now, let me give you an example. Let's say, for example, Jonathan, mm -hmm. you go to university. What did you study at university? Mass communication, media studies. Mass communication, media studies. Okay. And let's assume your parents never immigrated from America and you're born in Africa mm -hmm. and you have this degree in mass communication studies and you get a job as a computer analyst in America. Okay. You would not be able to get an H-1B visa because your job has nothing to do with your education. My, oh, wow. Okay. This is how the H-1B visa works. Now, oh, wow. let's say you get a job working at NBC television mm -hmm. as a producer. Mm -hmm. Well, yes, the minimum requirements of a job for a producer at NBC television would be a university mm -hmm. degree. Yes. You have a university degree mm -hmm. and it relates to your job. So mm -hmm. you would be able to get a job on an H-1B like that. Ah. Okay. And I'll give you one more example. Okay. Okay. Let's say you have a job, you have a degree as a botanist. Botanist is somebody who studies flowers. Flowers, yes. Okay. And you get a job working in a flower shop putting flowers in a vase. I got this job. I'm the guy who puts the flowers in the vase or the woman who puts the flowers in the vase. I make the vase of flowers and it gets sent off. Mm -hmm. I have this degree in botany. The degree is related to flowers. Yes. But guess what? What? Putting flowers in a vase doesn't require a college degree. Wow. So you wouldn't get an H-1B visa that way either. So wow. that's kind of how the H-1B visa works. You need all three, okay? Wow. And then the employer has to be willing to offer you a job at the prevailing wage of similarly employed workers. So you can't come here and work as a producer and make $15 an hour because producers make more than $15 right. an hour, presumably. Mm -hmm. All right, so now. It's really sticky for people, Brad, because being consistent in all three of those areas, in those simple examples you just gave, it's not easy. It is not. Now, most of the H-1B visas are going to computer-related jobs. More than 50% go to computer-related jobs. People with mathematical and computer-related degrees mm -hmm. working in IT. There were, for the fiscal year 2022, mm -hmm. there were 308,000 applications filed for H-1B visas. Okay, it's a lot of work visas filed. Yeah. They only give out 85,000. So out of the 308,000 H-1B applications, for fiscal year 2022, which is now, that would be last year's applications because fiscal year 2022, if you've been following Bradshaw Live, fiscal year 2022 started two weeks ago, oh, yes, October yes. 1st, mm -hmm. 2021. 308,000 applications filed for 85,000 spots. Now the way they do it is they give 20,000 H-1B visas to the first 20,000 go to people with master's degrees. So out of those 308,000 people, let's say 50,000 people with master's degrees are out in that group of 308,000 people. Uh, they do a lottery, Yolanda Vega, you know, like in Powerball mm -hmm. or the New York State yeah. Lottery where they literally pick things out of a hat mm -hmm. or maybe That's a computer do does it. it. I don't think they do it out of a hat anymore, well, but it's a computer does it. They <laughs> do a lottery, a uh, there'd be a lot of paper <laughs> if it was out of a hat. They pick 20 out of 50, thousand mm. the thirty thousand people i don't yeah, know what the yeah. exact number of master's degree people out of that three hundred eight thousand but let's, it's but it is twenty thousand twenty thousand only yeah. then let's say as a master's degree candidate 
you did not get into that first 20,000, mm -hmm. then the last 30,000 would go into the group of 288,000 for the last 65,000 visas. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, literally out of 85,000, 816, if you have a bachelor's degree, you probably had a one in 10 chance or a one in nine chance wow. of getting an H-1B visa. With a master's degree, we don't know how many people with master's degrees right. filed, I don't know that statistic, but probably a one in two chance, somewhere Jeez. in there, of getting an H-1B visa. They only give 65,000 out for a country, which is the largest economy in the world, yeah. still much bigger economy than China, okay? With 300 plus million people, it's 65,000 professional work visas a year. I mean, it's absolutely crazy. Yeah. Okay, now, before Donald Trump left office, he changed the rules mm -hmm. for H-1B visas and made it so difficult to get an H-1B visa that almost 24% of the initial H-1B visa applications that were filed under Donald Trump's presidency were denied. Wow. Versus, compared to 2015 with Obama, 6%. <laughs> he really made it much more difficult to get an H-1B visa. He didn't want professional workers coming here. <laughs> he didn't want anybody coming here. Now, one of the other things that he did, and the reason why I'm talking about this is because it's now back in the news yeah. again, was that he had the Department of Labor make a rule, and it hasn't passed yet, this rule, that instead of doing this lottery, which we just talked about, they're going to now decide on the 85,000 people out of, let's say 300,000 that apply, the highest paid of the 300,000 will now get the visa. Oh my god! So it will be a race to the top. How much can you offer somebody in pay as an American company to get them, that person in the top 85,000? Hmm. That was a proposed rule by the Department of Labor. It was never went into effect because there were a bunch of different groups that sued the Department of Labor and said that you're violating people's rights and the rules and everything else. Right. And it's been kind of caught up in court. Well, on Monday, the Biden administration weighed in on this. And they, they agreed with Donald Trump. And they're asking the court to uphold the Department of Labor's new rule that says that we're going to do it based on highest wage first. Now, the Department of Labor, they say they're raising wages. But, you know, according to most experts, what would happen, and what's happening now with H-1B visas, is that American companies are just outsourcing their work outside of the United States. Mm -hmm. They're not having workers literally come into the United States of America. And it actually causes the economy to be reduced, not to be increased. Right. Because they're now setting shops up in other countries rather than setting up employment here in America. Mm. So it's a huge, huge problem. So I'm surprised that Biden's doing this. So that's why we're talking yeah, about I it. Yeah, I am too. Now, Stuart Anderson, the executive director of the National Foundation for American Policy, which is a nonpartisan policy research organization focusing on trade, immigration-related issues, he wrote recently in Forbes magazine that if the Biden administration enacts the policy changes to H-1B visas, the changes will not be positive for employers. It would affect regulations on who can receive H-1B visas, how much employers pay. He said H-1B visas are important because they generally represent the only practical way for high-skilled foreign nationals, including international students, to work long-term in the United States and have the chance to become employment-based immigrants and U.S. citizens. In short, H-1B visas, nearly everyone from the founders of billion dollar companies to the people responsible for the vaccines and the medical care saving American lives would never have been in the United States. Mm. You know, the founders of Google, you know who it really affects? People on student visas who are here in the United States. How stupid is this in the United States of America? Mm -hmm. We, you know, A, have a cap and now do the cap based on highest salary. Right. When you get out of college, you're not getting, you're not like, getting the highest yeah. salary. You're getting entry level salary. So the United States spends their time and their resources and their efforts educating people and then saying, sorry, you can't work here, you gotta go home. That's wild. Hopefully, you know, when we're talking about immigration reform, part of immigration reform has to be part of H-1B reform too. We don't talk about it enough. We've been talking about amnesties, mm -hmm. but there's a problem with getting high skilled workers into the United States and I just read a statistic recently that there's over 
one million open jobs for computer-related jobs in America right now that can't be filled. And we're offering, out of a country of 300 and how many people? 20 million, 350 million, whatever we got here. Mm -hmm. A committee investigating the January 6th Capitol Hill riot. The insurrection, I wouldn't call it a riot. Would you call it a riot or insurrection? Uh, definitely insurrection. Insurrection. They announced today that they're going to hold Donald Trump's ally, Steve Bannon, in criminal contempt for refusing to comply with the subpoena. Now, Bannon was Trump's original um, uh, presidential election back in 2016. He was the original guy who ran Trump's presidential election. Mm -hmm. And then he was pushed aside. He was in the White House. And then eventually he had an outside role. And he's been an outside key advisor to Donald Trump throughout his entire political career. Mm -hmm. And this guy runs a way, 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 way right, right of any place that anybody would ever want to be, um, news organization, uh, you know, that gives a lot of, you know, fake news in favor of the pumpkin. Mm -hmm. So the Congress is concerned, and by the way, it's a, it's a bipartisan uh, congressional committee. There are Republicans on this committee as well. And they, they have concerns that Steve Bannon was advising Donald Trump on how to organize this insurrection. Uh -huh. And they want him to come and testify about what he knows. Now, Bannon has already not testified during both impeachments, although he was requested to do so by subpoena. He ignored it. Hmm. And you want to know what happened to him when he ignored it? What? Nothing. See? So that's why, so that is why, that's why he's ignoring it now. But we have a difference, Vanessa. Do you know what the difference is, Vanessa, between what could happen to him now versus what, why nothing happened to him? Because the president ain't saving him? Correct. <laughs> Correct. Because if, if he, he avoids a subpoena by Congress, right. it's up to the president of the United States. It is the president of the United States, his job, or her job, if it ever becomes a woman, mm -hmm. uh, is to enforce laws. That's what the president's job is. Congress <laughs> makes laws, presidents enforce laws. What made him think so, that he was going to be so, safe this time? So <laughs> Congress well, gave a subpoena, he ignored it, and during the impeachment, Trump's not going to enforce that subpoena. Right. So just ignored it. Forget it. You don't have to come testify. <laughs> but now we have President Biden, and we have a bipartisan congressional committee who has uh, subpoenaed Steve Bannon, and now it is up to President Biden and the Justice Department, who is run by uh, Merrick Garland, to now prosecute a man who is avoiding a, 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 yeah. a, 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 a subpoena by Congress. So we'll see what happens. It's going to be very interesting. Yeah, it's going to be interesting. It's going to be very, very interesting. And Donald Trump has to give a deposition. Yeah, Ooh. that'll be very interesting, Ooh. too. Yeah, the, during, um, during I don't know when this happened, but it uh, happened in, 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 oh, this happened in 2015. There was a demonstration by a group of, uh, of uh, people in front of Trump Tower in 2015 when Donald Trump was uh, running for president, mm -hmm. and they were protesting his words and his speeches, calling Mexicans rapists and criminals, and saying that was not fair yes. to lump all Mexicans as rapists and criminals. All right, there may be a rapist and criminal from Mexico. There's also rapists and criminals in the United States. Mm -hmm. There's also rapists and criminals in Norway. Yeah. There's also rapists <laughs> and criminals everywhere. Yeah. But you can't lump a whole entire country as that. Yeah. And uh, they were demonstrating, and one of the demonstrators was requested to leave the premises by a Trump security guard. And the and the demonstrator wouldn't leave. And the Trump security guard tried to grab one of their signs. Oh. You know, whatever the sign said. Mm -hmm. you're, you know, you're a pumpkin, Trump, or whatever <laughs> whatever the sign said. And the demonstrator wouldn't, wouldn't let wouldn't go let of them. Go. And then because he wouldn't let go of it, he got beat up Whoa. by the Trump security guard. So now there is a lawsuit against the Trump organization. Ooh. There's a lawsuit against the Trump organization. Donald Trump has been avoiding testifying in this lawsuit for 
what are we now? Seven years. <laughs> okay. Finally, all the appeals are exhausted. He's no longer president, so he can't have executive privilege. And every appellate judge has said he has to come testify. And what does he have to testify? What does he know about this? Did he tell a security guard to go do this to this protester? How did this security guard get the order to go down to the street, mm -hmm. rip the sign out, and beat this protester up? Yeah. Because he was beat up by a Trump security guard. Who gave that order? And Donald Trump how has to sit for a video te video deposition next week about Ooh. that. So I think that's pretty pretty interesting. You know, William Shatner, he went into space, right? Mm -hmm. We saw that yesterday. That was the big news. Yes. Right? Prince William, he's criticized all of the billionaires for going into space. All of them. Richard Branson, he's criticized Jeff Bezos. He's criticized uh, Elon Musk of Tesla. Mm -hmm. He says they're spending the money in the wrong way. Instead of searching for, for you know, the existence of life in space or, or searching space to go to Mars or wherever they want to go, they should be spending their money saving planet Earth. And you want to know what? He happens to be right. He does. He happens to be 100% right. I'm actually happy he said that. Why, why are all these billionaires fighting each other to be able to go to Mars? What the heck's happening on Mars? Nobody's living on Mars, okay? Honestly, and, to me, it's just a pissing contest, it is a, and, and nobody is running out of piss. And like, if you, that's and what if, it is. And to if me. you and if you want to, you want to really spend your money well. You want do, spend it on Earth, right? And yep. save planet Earth. Our planet is warming up by the moment. And by the way, I am sure this hump day, the thirteenth <laughs> rocket. Is not carbon neutral right. based on all of the right. all, all of that fire coming out of its. You would think. Yeah, there's a Swedish millionaire by the name of Johan Eliash. He bought four hundred thousand acres of Amazon rainforest. Now here is a guy who's doing something wow. to help planet Earth. He's yeah. not building. He's not building a spaceship. Mm -hmm. He's saving our planet. See? Right. Um, the, 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 he bought, he bought this property in Amazon for $14 million from a wow. logging company. So there was a logging company that would have ultimately ripped down all of wow. the trees in this area had he not bought the property from them. 14 million. Yeah. Now 14 million is nothing to a billionaire. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, uh, now according to fact check site Snopes, the $14 million amount is undetermined because... Elias has not really revealed the price of the purchase. The fourteen million dollars is being uh, circulated around the internet on a meme. Mm. But now, according to numerous reports from two thousand five, Elias did buy these four hundred thousand acres of rainforest. According to the Wall Street Journal, he bought a plywood plant to own by a logging company, Gethel Amazonas, and acquired the title to many acres of forest land. He said in an interview in the Guardian, which is from the UK. I closed the forestry operation down and laid off a thousand pe people to protect the forest. He says, now we, now we get to the heart of the problem. It's an interesting dilemma. You have about 8 million people in the Amazon forest, 7.99 million of whom are poor. They mm. need the jobs. So how do they get employed? Cutting trees. But people still have to eat. So if you fire them, sure they, surely they will log illegally. No, I have security people to control things, but in, honestly, you can't secure everything. Now, I wonder what he's doing, though, to help help the poor people right. eat. Since he took their jobs. Since he took their jobs. So he's I'm helping. Sure he's got, he's got to figure something out. He's got to figure out. something sure out there. He, I mean, yeah. because it can't be that costly to a billionaire right. to, to feed somebody. Well, 8 million people? That's... I don't know. Well, it's apparently he gave them severance packages, according to Jill. I don't see it here in my cards, but apparently he's, he gave them money. Yeah, and in the end, it's he, he has this entire land now, and it's a matter of, like, who's going to maintain this land? It's not going to be this gentleman. But if you can buy... If you can buy, uh, uh, he, ga he gave he gave the farm workers, by the way, generous severance, severance packages. At least that's what he claims. Now, if you can buy 400,000 acres of Amazon rainforest for $14 million, 
surely Jeff Bezos oh, please. and Elon Musk and that Richard Branson right. can put together five or ten billion dollars mm -hmm. to buy the whole freaking rainforest. Yeah. And then and and give all the people in the Amazon enough money to live and eat. Yeah. I'm sure they have that money. And, and it, it wouldn't, wouldn't put it anything. and it wouldn't put a dent. Yeah. Wouldn't put a dent in 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 their savings. So Jeff Bezos, the winner of the next <laughs> the winner of the next crew verse crew verse squad contest, whenever that will be. We don't want your freaking spaceship anymore. <laughs> we want right. you to make a donation in honor of Bradshaw Live yeah. and the winner of the crew versus squad uh, game to save the Amazon rainforest, which is really what you should be doing, damn it. Here, here. Right? Here, here. Yeah. Tell him, Brad. Yeah. yeah. And you want to know what, Vanessa? You don't ask, you don't get. So we're telling him what to right. do. <laughs> All right. And uh, coronavirus. And by the way, there's some memes. Um, let's see. Uh, Geriatric Millen uh, uh, said in a meme, uh, your uh, your turn to purchase land to stop deforestation, mm. and um, and Caroline oh, wow. said yes, no more wasting your money. So I mean, people on the internet, we're not just saying this. This is coming right from the internet. Yeah. All right. So maybe if enough people on the internet got to keep on saying, keep it. saying it, maybe they'll start doing it. Yeah. Forty four point six million confirmed coronavirus cases. There was an interesting article in the New York Times today. It said, you know, when we had our first lockdown last winter, everyone's concerned about lockdown in the winter, because especially in the Northeast mm -hmm. and, you know, across the northern states, that it's going to be cold, everyone's going to be inside, and coronavirus is going to, you know, go flying around inside. That's how most people get sick. Mm -hmm. But there's an interesting article in the New York Times today that was saying that because more than 70% of the United States population is either, um, is either already contracted COVID or is vaccinated against COVID, more than 70% now. And they're now going to start to allow children uh, ages five and up oh, wow. to get vaccinated very shortly. The, the jury is out. There are some experts who are saying, we still have to be very weary. We could have another outbreak of coronavirus. And there's others that are saying, maybe the worst is behind us. Mm. What do you think, Vanessa? If you're, you're using your your scientific intuition. Oh, jeez. Scientific <laughs> intuition. One, I haven't fully developed that one. You haven't. I, I, I've told you guys before. I feel like it's just it's it's never fully gonna go away. We just work around it and see what we can get. But I, I have no take on this, honestly. I'm I'm just taking it day by day. Now, scientists, the ones who are say, you still got to worry, Britain and Israel have higher vaccination rates, uh -huh. and they're still struggling with outbreaks. Uh, but many scientists say, you know what, maybe the worst is behind us. I hope so. I, I don't know what to believe, but 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 we still, obviously all still have to be... Worst. We the all very worst is behind us, though. Mm. Like, the fact that we had no solution or that the world had to shut down because we had literally no idea what was going right. on, I think that is the very worst. So a woman was sleeping in her home in Canada. We're going to start in Canada. Okay. And uh, she's thanking her lucky stars, literally, after narrowly avoiding a meteorite that slammed <laughs> into her pillow what? while she was sleeping. What? Yes, yeah, slammed into her pillow, but missed her head by obviously oh inches. Oh, my gosh. Can you imagine you're sleeping and what? a meteorite just goes flying through your house into your bed? Are you serious? Wow. See, this is a wacky. This We're off to a good start here. This is wacky. What? Yeah, the Victoria News reported that Ruth Hamilton was snoozing in her home <laughs> in Golden, a town in southeastern British Columbia on October 4th, when she heard a crash and felt debris on her face. Oh, my gosh. She jumped up, turned on the light, couldn't figure out what the heck has happened. Police officer responded to her 9-11 call, wondered if the jagged object that landed on her pillow might have come from a construction project. We called the Canyon Project, said the police, to see if they were doing any blasting, and they weren't. But they did say they had seen a bright light in the sky that exploded and caused some booms. 
Uh, according to uh, this woman, her name is Hamilton. She said, I was shaking and scared when it happened. I thought someone had jumped in or it was a gun or something. It's almost a relief when we realized it could have only fallen out of the sky. She said, the only thing I can think of is saying is life is precious. It could be gone at any moment, even when you think you're safe and secure in your bed. I hope I never, ever have to take it for granted again. Wow. That's crazy. You know what that reminds me of? That movie... Robin Williams movie. I didn't like even like the movie, but it just reminds me of the movie, uh, The World According to Garp. It was an I old, uh, an old Robin Williams that. movie, and he goes to buy a house with his wife. And right when he buy, right before he buys a house, the plane goes crashing into the house. Oh! And the wife says, "I don't want this house. Right. It's crazy." He goes, "No, we want this house." What are the odds another plane is ever going to crash in this house? We are completely safe here. And so I think, I think this woman, Miss Hamilton, is like. You know, like, you know, Robin Williams. What are the odds another meteorite's going to come crash hey, your house? She is safe in that house now. Listen. The worst has already happened. The worst has <laughs> already happened. Exactly. Seeking to please his wife. This is quite ridiculous. A man is really trying to help his wife out here and please him. Uh, she wished to have a more diversified view from their family house. So a Bosnian self-taught innovator has built a rotating house what allowing her to watch the rising sun in one one moment and then once the sun rises to turn the house so she could watch the people walk by on what? the street kind of wow. that's ridiculous he says i got tired of my wife's complaints <laughs> that's hilarious <laughs> that part I, is actually I, hilarious I, i'm gonna tell you something she had to be complaining a lot for him to do this Wow, uh, and, that's actually pretty dope, And though. frequently refurbishing of our family house, and I said, I'll build you a rotating house so you can spin it as you wish. <laughs> Would that get you dizzy? Would that get you dizzy? Motion sickness. Like a yeah, motion. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, there was a restaurant in Times Square at, at oh, the Marriott yeah. Marquis. And it, and it circles, circles around. But you don't and feel you it. You don't feel it. It's you really just, slow, but you know that what? That one looks kind of fast. Yeah, that one looks a lot fast. <laughs> you know, I'm thinking like I'm eating, I'm like, I'm like trying to eat some cereal and you know, the spoon is like, stop, <laughs> well, stop rotating the house. I don't think it goes that fast. Can you imagine? I, can you imagine if it's going that fast, you, yeah, you throw yeah, up. Yeah, no, I, I think I think it's actually a really dope idea if it, you know, goes super slow. And then it, you probably can, like... What would happen you know, if you're in the shower and he just turns on the house and starts spinning like that? You go <laughs> flying, the water's, like, all over the place. I mean... That'd be a bad comedy movie. <laughs> I don't know. So many questions. So many Yeah. We, we need to find out more about this spinning house. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Meanwhile, archaeologists in Israel... Uh, they they uncovered what they believe is the world's oldest wine factory. Oh. 1500 year old complex Whoa. was used to produce wine in huge commercial quantities with the directors of the excavation calculating that around 2 million liters of wine were made and sold every year from this wine factory. Wow. This wine factory existed somewhere between 330 AD, about wow. 300 years after the birth of Jesus Christ and was in production there until 14 53. This is the largest dig going on in Israel right now. They have more than 300 people working on this dig. The directors of the excavation said the site was most likely the main production area for wine in the entire region from Gaza and Ashkelon. The wine would be distributed throughout the entire Mediterranean. It was a prestige product which was liked by many members of the arist aristocracy during this period. And some amphorae, known as Gaza jars, were discovered intact. Rare Persian wine presses, older than the complex itself, 2,300-year-old uh, wine presses were also found that at the site. That is wild. That's actually pretty dope. You that's know, pretty I love, cool. I love they, history. You know, so that's that's you know like... You know, 2,000 years ago, they, they, they were making wine in a factory. You know, yes. you think it's just a guy stopping on some wine right. in a, you know, in a I in, mean, the way they drink wine, you know, yeah. well, I, I see it every time on every, like, 300 and, you know, all the old, yeah, old school. You see all the gladiator movies, yeah, they always yeah. drink wine, It's right? always wine. I'm like, did they ever <laughs> drink water? So I, like, not, maybe sense. not, maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I don't know if they ever showered back then. They're always dirty. dirty and wine. They're always Look. dirty and drinking wine, right? They are always dirty, yeah. drinking wine, and <laughs> just living I would, life. Look. I would not have wanted to live that during. I'm happy I'm in this age. I, are you happier in this age? What the heck did anybody do at night when there were no lights? 
Right. Right. What the heck? You know, all right? It's dark now. Can't what? read nothing. Can't read. You're just, can't sitting, you're just sitting in the dark. So you're, many questions. A lot of questions. Can you imagine? You're like, can you imagine you're just sitting in the dark? quick. Are you there? <laughs> yes, I told you I'm there 10 times already. Shut up. Well, actually, I mean, like, <laughs> it's just, if you really think about it, though, could you imagine not having your cell phone to just walk you down the street because you have no navigation? Yes, I can, because I had to use MapQuest, or I had to, like, just, like, read oh, I, a map. I, I could imagine so, life without a cell phone, because I I'm lived so, half my life without a right, cell phone. Right, but, like, people today, but, like, uh, this new generation that w they, they were born with cell phones, they are saying the same thing we're saying about, could you imagine no light? Because, like, they have never had a life without cell phones cell phones right. so they're i'm sure they enjoyed their life just as much as we enjoying ours we know. just can't not go back then. i don't know but <laughs> maybe maybe it would be like a ted bill and ted's excellent adventure oh. <laughs> we just go back in a telephone booth for like See, a day yeah you, we grab julius caesar yeah. bring him back bring him back and, and interview what, him, right. and interview him here on bradshaw live <laughs> that would be crazy <laughs> Boy, all my 80s uh, That was movies. my show. That was your Those show? Bill and, yeah, Bill and Bill Ted's, Ted's Excellent Adventures. Right. No way, Ted. <laughs> well, a movie. It was right? a, movie. a movie, yeah. It was well, a, movie. a couple yeah. movies there. Yeah, they came out with a new one now, but I didn't see the oh, new nah. one. It was it, is it recently, the, recently. The, the original cast? The original cast, yeah. Oh. I think they were dads, Ted and Bill, at that point. Really? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I would actually see that. Was that what was your favorite movie growing up? And that's quick, quickly. I never oh, asked you. Any uh, Home Alone. Really? Oh, is it the first, the first movie. one in Chicago or the second one when he's lost first. in the Plaza Hotel? No, the Plaza Hotel. The Plaza, Plaza Hotel. Oh, you're a New Yorker. I'm, I'm the first one, Chicago. <laughs> Original. That, that, they're both coming back they're, very soon. You'll see them soon. We watch soon. it every yeah. Christmas Eve. Thanks for watching. For more Bradshaw Live, like and subscribe to our YouTube channel.